Uh, last week, thank you. Last Wednesday, I have copies of all the paper stuff that I handed out then, the practice exam, the solutions to it, and the exam three and final exam information. Uh, that's also online, so some of you may have downloaded it from there, but feel free to you know pick up an extra copy of the exam if you'd like to do that. Uh, the homework that is due today, no, the homework that's due, <laughs> sorry, the homework from last week is due by Wednesday at 5 o'clock. If you'd like to turn it in today, that's fine. The homework that just got passed back, most of it was right on target. In fact, there was really only one sort of style issue that I would say came up more than once. Uh, some of you are writing correct mathematics, but not sort of, I don't know, uh, stylistically beautiful mathematics. Here's, that, and that's, you know, that's fine, that's sort of the next step, but the idea would be read back through whatever you're offering me as the proof of some result and ask yourself, do I need this, do I need this, have I used all the hypotheses, have I put in too much? And this was simply a matter of using too much when you needed to show um, if I is an ideal of R, of R, and I happens to contain the unity element, show that I is actually all of R, and what essentially all of you realized after sort of playing around a little bit with the properties of being an ideal, specifically the absorption property, is that, well, if you hand me an element in R, you have to show that it's in I, but the point is R is R times 1. That's just the definition of unity. But this is in R. That's where it was chosen. This, by hypothesis, is in I. So that means that this is in I. And in effect, that's the guts of the proof. What some of you then did was said, oh, but we also know, by definition of an ideal, that 1 times R is in I, and that certainly is also R. So because as part of the definition of the absorption property for an ideal in a ring, you know that regardless of which order you do the product in, whether you multiply the ring times the ideal or the ideal times the ring, that you get something back in the ideal. Some of you then went ahead and told me that this is true. Well, it certainly is true, but it's a complete non-issue. Once you've told me that is true, that's all you need. You've convinced me that R is in the ideal, and you're done. So you're done here. It's not that this isn't true. It's simply not necessary, or it's extraneous once you've convinced me that R is in the ideal. So again, just a style comment on the, on uh, something that I saw a couple of times. And you know, obviously, there's. I'm not surprised to see this statement only because that's a part of the definition of being an ideal, but it turns out you don't need the full force of the definition of an ideal in order to get there. Okay. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, in effect, put the finishing touches on what you just told me was the basic goal and how it's achieved. I'm going to re-explain some of the details there and then spend the rest of tonight simply running through a bunch of examples so that you hopefully start getting a feel as to how to manipulate with these things. I know after class on Wednesday, a couple of you came back in here and started staring at the board as to how, <laughs> how you know, how'd you get from here to here and here to here? Well, what we'll do is play with enough additional examples tonight, I think, that you'll all hopefully get the right you know, intuition about how that's working. So here's the, the big idea. For a minute, just for now, Pretend I'm not even working with an irreducible polynomial that I've simply given you a polynomial. So let's start with start with uh, some polynomial. I'm at least going to give it some guts. In other words, make it have degree at least one, so it's got x's in it. In and let's see in the statement of this thing in e and f bracket x. Okay, with degree of f of x at least 1. Now here's what I want you to do. You know, it might be the case that f is irreducible, or it might be the case it's not irreducible. That actually plays a key role in determining whether or not when you form the factor ring, f bracket x mod the ideal that you get by looking at all multiples of little f, whether or not that's a field. Okay. 
And since our goal is to write down a field that has certain properties, we'd like f to be irreducible. But there's no guarantee that the polynomial that you get handed up front is irreducible or not. The same goal still applies, though. What we're interested in doing is we want to build a field, capital E, so that two things are true. Let's see, so that E is a subfield of F. I'm simply going to write that as contained in, but sharp containment. That's the notation that we've used when we've got some structure to each of the pieces involved. And secondly, there's some element, there's some alpha in E, I'm sorry, in, oops, got these backwards. I must do that. F in E, I'm not sure why the author writes it that way, but that's all right some alpha in the big field so that when you plug it into F that you get zero. Again, intuitively what you're trying to do is find some element. It might already be in the given field, but more than likely it's going to have to be in this larger field with the property that when you plug it in that zero comes out. And the first remark is this. Look, if the polynomial you happen to start with, f of x is not irreducible in f bracket x. In the question still makes sense, folks. Find some poly find some element in some larger field so that when you drop it in, you get zero. So the question on the surface doesn't look like it has anything to do with whether or not the original polynomial is irreducible. Okay, but our only tool to build fields requires us to have irreducible polynomials. It turns out that piece of it is not an issue, and this is what piece one of this four-step outline of the proof that you just wrote down for me talks about. Then here's what I want you to do. Simply write f of x as p of x times q of x, where p of x is irreducible. Can we do that? Yeah, folks. If, and here's this analogy that I've been playing up for the last five or six weeks. If I hand you an integer, positive integer, if the integer's not prime, it means you can always find a prime factor of it. I don't care whether the other thing's prime or not. If I hand you the integer 12, it's not prime. So that means somewhere along the way you can factor some prime number out. Factor 2 out if you want. Factor 3 out if you want. I don't care. And what's left over? Is it prime? I don't care. Just give me a prime factor. Well, we can always do the same thing for polynomials. As long as you hand me a polynomial that's not irreducible, it means that, well, it actually means that you can write it as a product of irreducible things, but all I'm worried about is that just pull out something irreducible. Now, here's the point. If I can find some field that has an element inside it so that when you plug that element into P, that this thing becomes zero. In other words, if I can make p of alpha zero, then hey, if you plug that same thing into f, then f of alpha is p of alpha times q of alpha. I don't care what q of alpha is. I just don't care because it's going to be zero times q of alpha, which will be zero. So the point is, if we can find a zero, a field a f you know, e containing alpha so that p of alpha is zero, then f of alpha will be p of alpha times q of alpha, which will be zero times q of alpha, which will be zero. In other words, as long as I can find a zero for an irreducible factor of f, then I will have found a zero for f. No big deal. So what that means is, all we really need to do, all we really need to do is to build, and I make sure, yep, is to find a field F, no, E, yeah, E, and some element alpha in E so that P of alpha is zero. Because as soon as I can make P of alpha equal to zero, then necessarily F of alpha is also zero, because the goal is to find a zero for F. All right. 
So in effect, the way that the mathematicians would phrase it is, we reduce the problem to one of finding a zero for an irreducible factor of f. You think, well, so why bother? And the reason that we want to bother doing that is, if the goal is to find a zero for an irreducible polynomial, then I have a chance, because I know how to build fields corresponding to irreducible polynomials. Here's how we do it. So here's step two. So now, complete this task. This task. Can we do it? Yeah. Here's how we do it. Method. Let's see if I'm going to get the numbering right. Okay. Here's step two. This is really where all the hard work has gone into. The statement, since p of x is irreducible, irreducible in f bracket, f bracket x, this thing, f bracket x, factoring with the ideal consisting of all the multiples of p of x is a field. Of the four steps in achieving the basic goal, folks, this one is the one we had to work hardest to get. If you take f bracket x and you take a polynomial that's irreducible in f bracket x and you look at the ideal consisting of all the multiples of it, then the factor ring that you form, f bracket x mod those uh, multiples of the fixed element, irreducible element p of x, is a field. Okay. All right, so what's step three? Step three is I need to convince you of two things. I need to convince you of the fact that I can view f as living inside E. We view f inside E. It's a little bit of a ruse, but it's completely legit. It's the same way that we view the integers living inside the rationals. I mean, they sort of do, but they sort of don't. The integers live inside the rationals. How? You associate each integer with the symbol z divided by 1. That's how every integer is rational. I need to teach you how I want you to view every element of the original field, of the smaller field, as living inside the larger field. Take an element in the smaller field, and I'm trying to be totally consistent with the notation here. Take any element A in the smaller field and associate it with, I'll put sort of a wavy line here, view it as its coset A plus PX. Well, this certainly is an element sitting inside this ring. Why? Because A is an element of the field. So an element of the field can simply be viewed as a polynomial of degree zero. It is a polynomial. It's not a very interesting one, admittedly, but that's okay. Once you've got any element in here, you can talk about its coset. And so what we're about to do, and of course we denote this by, by A with a bar on it. If you hand me an element of the field, I'm going to ask you to associate it with the element inside this factoring that corresponds to simply taking the field element, viewing it as a polynomial of degree zero, and then looking at its coset. And then finally, here's the punchline. Let alpha be the element x plus px in E. And I'm going to give it a name, i.e., the specific element x bar. The coset corresponding to the specific polynomial that you write down in here, the polynomial 1x plus 0, if you want to view it that way. Or we, of course, we simply just call it x. Then here's the point. Then we have p of alpha equals 0. And here's why. And this was the question that was asked at the end of Wednesday. And let me reiterate why it's true. In the end, folks, when we're talking about this ring, this factor ring, what does it mean to say that two cosets are equal inside the factoring? It's not necessarily the case that their coset representatives are equal. In order to deem two cosets to be equal, all you need to do is ask, if you take this coset representative and you subtract this coset re representative, do you get something inside the subgroup? That's the definition of what it means for two cosets to be the same. 
Because remember, when we form these cosets, we form them corresponding to the additive structure. This lives inside here as an ideal. That means that this thing is a subgroup of that under the plus operation. So if we're trying to equate cosets, saying two cosets are equal is simply a matter of asking whether or not the two coset representatives have the property that, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, AB inverse is in the subgroup. But when we're using additive notation, AB inverse comes, becomes the expression A minus B. So here's why, here's why P of alpha is zero inside E. Well, what do I have to do? I have to show, hmm, I have to show that inside this factoring that this coset is the same as this coset. That's what it means to say that two things are equal inside this factoring, which happens to be a field by all the hard work we've done. So what do we have to do? We have to show that if we plug alpha in everywhere we see an x, in the polynomial P, we get an expression so that when we subtract zero from it, that the result lands inside this ideal. In other words, is a multiple of P of X. In fact, what I'm going to show you folks is the cosine representative that we get not only lives inside the collection of multiples of P of X, I'm going to show you that it actually is P of X. So it's an even stronger statement than we need, but it turns out we get a little bit more here. So what do we have to do? Well, what does it mean to plug alpha in? Well, what's alpha? It's this. So this is going to start looking a little bit weird. So let's see, if I take P of X, so let me not show here yet. So write, well, what does P of X look like? I don't know, P of X as, hmm, it's something in F bracket X. So let's write it as A N X to the N plus A N minus one X to the N minus one plus dit 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 plus a1x plus a0. So there's p of x. So let's see, what's p of alpha? Well now you have to be a little bit careful and here's why. Alpha is some element that lives inside this bigger field E. It makes sense to multiply elements from the smaller field F, each a sub i in F, the smaller field, by something in a larger field E, the result's going to give you something in E. But how am I asking you to view the elements of F as living inside E? I'm asking you to associate each element of F with its bar. In other words, with the element A plus P of X inside E. So let's do this operation. Plug in alpha everywhere you see an X. So what I'm doing is two steps at once here. I'm plugging in alpha in everywhere I see an X. But because this thing is in the big field E, and when I do this product, it's a product of things inside E, I'm then asking you to multiply that by something in F. Okay, that's legit as long as you're viewing F as something living inside E, and the way that we've been asked to do that is to form the bar expression. Okay, so this is just how do you evaluate something when you're then asked to multiply it by something in the smaller field? Answer, you view the thing in the smaller field as something in the larger field, and we've asked you to do that just by associating with bar. So plus, let's see, a sub n minus 1 bar alpha to the n minus 1, plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plus a1 bar alpha plus a0 bar. That's what p of alpha is, and I need to somehow convince you that this coset is the same as the zero coset inside e bar. I'm sorry, inside e. All right, well, let's see what this is. This is, well, I know what a n bar is. It's, hmm, let's write it this way. This is a n bar. What's alpha? It's x bar. x bar to the n plus a n minus 1 bar. I'm just plugging in what alpha is. It is x bar plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plus a 1 bar. What's alpha? It's x bar. A zero bar. Alpha is x bar. I mean, th that's the particular coset that I've happened to have chosen inside capital E. It is one because x itself is a polynomial. Oh, but wait a minute. Everything is a bar here. And the point is, when we did coset multiplication and addition, the coset multiplication and addition was simply take whatever the corresponding cosets were and multiply them together. 
In other words, when we're doing x times x times x times x times x, n times, and then barring it, it's the same as taking a n x to the n and putting a big bar on top. So I'm going to write it this way, a n minus 1, x n minus 1, plus d d d plus a 1, x plus a 0, bar. Definition of multiplication inside the factory. Mm -hmm. That's not an underline, that's a bar on all this. Mm -hmm. That's just definition of multiplication in the factory. Oh, but wait a minute, that equals by definition a n x n plus a n minus 1 x n minus 1 plus dit 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 plus a 1 x plus a 0. What does bar mean? Bar means look at the coset of that thing inside the factoring. And here's what the coset, I'm sorry, here's what the subgroup inside the factoring was. It was ideal generated by px. But this looks familiar. It is. In fact, it is p of x by definition. So this piece is just p of x. So somehow we've run this thing through the original polynomial and what got kicked out. Well, eventually wasn't the polynomial itself, but at least was the coset for the polynomial inside the factor ring. And now here's the claim equals 0 plus px. And this is what we were sort of looking at at the end of Wednesday. Why is it the case that I can trade this thing in for this? Well, two cosets are equal precisely when if you take the one coset representative and you subtract the other, that's easy to do. You just get p of x because I'm just subtracting 0. Whether or not you get something that's inside the subgroup. So the question is whether or not p of x minus 0 lives inside the collection of multiples of p of x. P of x minus 0 is just P of x itself. Is P of x a multiple of P of x? Of course it is. It happens to be 1 times P of x. So these are equal precisely because that minus that is inside the subgroup. In other words, it is 0 bar or is 0 in E. And so what this computation shows is that if you plug alpha in everywhere you see an x in the polynomial P of x, here's what you get which by definition just allows you to start playing around with the appropriate cosets, which eventually kicks out this expression. And once you get this expression, the point is that's zero. So we've found a polynomial. It has coefficients in the bigger field. And it has the property that there's some element inside the bigger field with the property that when you plug it in everywhere you see an x into the original polynomial, you get zero. So there's the goal achieved. Now, if you're still not comfortable with what the heck these fields look like, the fields that you get by starting with a polynomial, picking out an irreducible factor of that polynomial, that's typically not a piece of the game that we'll need to worry about because typically the polynomials that you'll be handed will already be irreducible, so you typically don't have to mess around with step one. The idea is to simply form this field, get comfortable with viewing the original field as living inside here, and then picking out the special element that behaves as the zero of the original polynomial, and that special element is always this one. Example. Example. Here's a polynomial, x squared plus 1 in q, no, let's do it in r bracket x, in r bracket x. So here's an example that I've mentioned a couple times already. Are the reals here? Let's see. Statement one, x squared plus one is irreducible in R bracket x. How do I know that? Well, at least it's a degree two polynomial, and those are much easier to deal with than uh, degree four or higher. Because if you have degree two or three to convince me that the polynomial is irreducible, you simply have to convince me that, that there's no zeros for this polynomial inside the given field of coefficients. And clearly there are not. Okay, and I'd like you to get in this habit, since degree is less than or equal to three, because degree is two, we need only check for zeros. Check that x squared plus one 
has no zeros in the reals in script R, and that's clear. Are there any elements in the reals with the property that when you square them and you add one, you get zero? No. Okay. All right, so now I have an irreducible polynomial in R bracket X. So here's what I can do. So here's step two. If we form the field E, R bracket X, mod the ideal generated by X squared plus one, is a field. That's step two. Here's step three. The reals live inside this new field E. I can view the real numbers as living inside here. How do I do that? I simply take my favorite real number, what should we call it, how about little a, and I associate it with the coset a plus x squared plus one. So if somebody says, where's the number two living inside here? The answer is technically you're viewing it as two bar, or you're viewing it as the coset corresponding to the number two, where you're adding the subgroup ideal generated by x squared plus one. And now here's the punchline. Where is the zero? Alpha equals this thing, x bar. In other words, x plus quantity x squared plus one. And the claim is that if we plug that value, that expression, into the original polynomial, that zero should come out. So let's check or verify that it works that if we look at, let's call this thing f here, f of x, f of x, if we look at f of alpha, that we get zero. Well, let's see what it gives us. What's the polynomial? The polynomial is one times x squared plus one. So let's see, I first have to view this polynomial as having coefficients inside the larger field. That's easy to do. It's one bar x plus, I'm sorry, x squared plus one bar viewed as an element of uh, the larger field, larger field. So you take each of the coefficients, they happen to be one on the x squared term, zero here, and one on the constant term. You view them as living inside the larger field by associating the real numbers with their corresponding cosets, in other words, a bar. And now what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to plug in alpha. So I'm sorry, I should have had an alpha here. So that's what it means to plug in alpha. And so let's see what we get. Well, we get uh, one bar is one plus x squared plus one. That's what one bar means. What's alpha? Well, I've written it down. There it is explicitly. It's x squared plus Here's one bar, it's coset. Here's alpha squared. Well, alpha is just this thing, so when I square this, I get x squared plus its corresponding coset plus one bar, which is one plus. And now, folks, we're just going to do coset arithmetic. The way you add or multiply cosets is you simply add or multiply the corresponding coset representatives. In other words, that times that is, by definition, x squared, because it's one times x squared squared plus one, that's what that coset is, plus, let's add it to this coset, one plus x squared plus one. Definition of coset addition, add the coset representatives. And now what's the final step? This is, just like it was in the general proof, zero. Why are these two cosets the same, that one and that one? Because if I take that minus that, do I get a multiple of x squared plus one? I certainly do. I've sort of preloaded it to work out that way. So if it seems like, you know, it's sort of cheating, you, you sort of rig the polynomial to work correctly, you do. That's exactly what you do. Equals zero bar. So I've just plugged in alpha, and what came out was zero. So I've just built a field, it looks like this, and that field has the property that there is, that field has the following two properties. First of all, it has the property that the reals live inside there. 
And secondly, it has the property that there is something in there so that when you plug it into this polynomial, that zero comes out. So you're thinking, it's I? Because I know at least some field, one I'm relatively familiar with, the complex numbers, that actually has an element inside it that when you plug it into this polynomial, zero comes out. Complex I works. So if you want to think of this thing as complex I, that's not a bad intuition. Of course, you could just as validly think of this as minus I. Because minus I is also a complex number that has the property that when you square it and add one, you get zero. And if the question is, which one is it? The answer is, you, you can choose. And in fact, just this little bit of publicity for next semester, one of the things that we'll focus on is sort of how many choices there are of what you might identify this element inside this extension field of the reals as being. Is it I or minus I? At this stage, it just is. It's some symbol that lives inside some field with the property that when you square it and you add one, you get zero. Call it I or minus I. It makes no difference. What, what, what you call it, what your friend calls it, corresponds to some choice. There's sort of a two choices to be made, and it turns out corresponding to this sort of construction, there is a group having two elements that will play a role, and that will be a big part of the discussion next semester. You start with a polynomial. That polynomial, assuming it's irreducible, and that'll be the situation in all the ones that'll be of interest, assuming the polynomial is irreducible will allow you to form a field. Inside that field there will be an element. That element will behave correctly. In other words, that element will become a zero of the original polynomial. Now the question is, well, have you built other elements that work? Yeah, folks, if instead of using alpha, I would have used minus alpha. That's another perfectly good zero for this polynomial as well. So there's actually two zeros in here. Hmm. And what will happen is, among all the zeros that you can build of the original polynomial, I've just built not only this one, but there's another one as well. It's negative. The question will be, how do you somehow, let's say, go between the zeros? Can you get from one of the zeros to the other zero? Yeah, yeah, it's multiply by minus one. That's how you get from this one to the other one. And if you remember way back, one of the original examples of groups that we looked at in here was under multiplication, the group consisting of the two elements, one and minus one, under multiplication with a group. And that group is somehow going to play a role here in identifying the things that behave as zeros for this polynomial. And that actually fairly can be described as the, the main idea or a piece of the main idea that we will spend most of next semester studying, how the groups actually get back involved in the identification of these zeros. So, okay. Now, for a homework problem, and I apologize, uh, Young Lee came to my office before class and asked about this. On the website, folks, I didn't give a full picture of what one of the homework problems was. So when I assigned this, uh, this problem last Monday, I think I gave you a full description in class, but on the website, the full description didn't appear. It turns out, in this particular case, turns out that this field, if you look at Rx, mod x squared plus 1, that field is isomorphic to the complex numbers. And what I ask you to do for homework is convince me that it is by actually writing down the isomorphism. So show this. This is one of the turn-in problems. And I'll give you a hint. You somehow have to write down a function from, well, from one to the other. It turns out it's easiest to write down a function from here to here. And you have to convince me that the function that you write down has the appropriate two properties to be a ring homomorphism, that phi of A plus B is phi of A plus phi of B, and that phi of A times B is phi of A times phi of B. And then you have to convince me that the function is one to one and on to. So let me tell you what the function is. I'll give you a little bit more. Phi from the complex numbers to this thing, mod x squared plus 1. By taking this, phi of, well, I know what any complex number looks like, where a and b are reals, equal to this. Trade in i for x. 
Hey, deny for X. What the heck does that mean? Yeah, folks, that's exactly what we did here. The thing that behaves like I is what you get when you look at the cosec corresponding to X. So trading I in for X is not a bad idea, plus this cosec. In other words, take phi of A plus BI, where I is complex negative 1, or complex square root of negative 1, trade it in for A plus BX, notice now it's become a polynomial, and look at the corresponding cosec. Here is the function from the complex numbers to the reals, convince me that this function is in fact an isomorphism. There will be eh, really only one hard thing to do. And what's that? That will be to show that phi of a complex number times another complex number, so call your other complex number something like a prime plus b prime times i or something like that, that when you do the multiplication that this corresponding function actually uh, works as far as being a ring homomorphism. Uh, the comment about the homework is on the website all I've put here is f bracket x or f of x and so on the website what I should have put is f of x is x squared plus 1 and I made that change right before class but for any of you that maybe have printed off what's on the website I'll go ahead and add that here is the polynomial that I want you to use x squared plus 1. Okay. Questions there? Comments? This is what we would call the elegant way of constructing the complex numbers from the real numbers. Now, the complex numbers and the real numbers are actually very, well, they're, they're obviously closely related. Somehow you can get from the complex numbers, or from the real numbers to the complex numbers, just by throwing in one additional symbol, the thing called i, and you deem that new symbol to have the property that its square is negative 1, and then you simply look at all the possible symbols that you can form that include the reals and this thing called i. So you throw in all the reals, you throw in all the i times reals, you know, bi, so all the pure imaginaries, you want, and then you throw in all the sums of those, so that allows you to sort of move around in the complex plane, and that's the entire complex plane. In other words, that's what everything in the complex numbers is defined to look like, and it turns out that that's built in a, in a, in a stylistic way from the reals by doing this particular construction. Uh, on the other hand, look, we don't have to start with the reals, and we don't have to start with x squared plus 1. We can start with any field we want in any polynomial that's irreducible inside the polynomials over that field and play the same game. So for example, here's example two, here's a polynomial, the polynomial x squared minus two in q bracket x. Now for what it's worth, if I had tried to play this game in r bracket x, it would be uninteresting because I already know a zero for this polynomial in r bracket x, the square root of two. But because the square root of two is not rational, this thing has no zeros since x squared minus two has no zeros in the scalar field inside of Q. Why? Since the square root of 2 is not rational. By a proof that Euclid gave us about 2,000 years ago, x squared minus 2 is irreducible in Q bracket x. I'll put in parentheses the degree is less than or equal to 3. Of course, there's other proofs to show that this thing is irreducible in Q bracket X. You can haul it Eisenstein's criterion because we're asking for irreducibility over Q. All you need to do is check that there's some prime that behaves correctly. The prime 2 has a property. It doesn't divide that coefficient. It does divide 0. It does divide 2. But the square of the prime doesn't divide 2. So Eisenstein's criterion would get you there. Uh, let's see, it has no zeros in Z either. Obviously not. So. Okay, so it's irreducible. So, what do we know? Uh, the field E consisting of the cosets of that polynomial is a field, is a field, that's nice, and it contains a zero for the original polynomial. And if we look at alpha equal to x bar, in other words, x plus the polynomials that are multiples of x squared minus 2 is a 0 for f of x. 
inside E. In other words, when we plug this thing into this polynomial, zero will come out. Let's do the computation again. Why? Check that it does. I mean, I want you to see it's going to be exactly the same analysis as has come up in the general case and it just came up in the specific case that we did over R bracket X. Plug in alpha everywhere you see an X in the original polynomial. In other words, do alpha squared minus 2. And of course, the rub is, you know, you have to view the coefficients in the original polynomial as living inside the bigger field. So really, you should call it 2 bar. And if you wanted, technically, there's a 1 bar outside here. But 1 bar is the same as 1. It is just the, the unity element is what? It's, well, what's alpha? It's this thing. So that's x bar squared minus 2 bar, because that's what alpha is, x bar. Oh, but wait a minute. The bars do the same thing as the original operations. Properties of coset multiplication. The way you add and multiply cosets is the, just you do them by combining the coset representatives. So you want to do this, this could be technically x squared bar minus 2 bar, but then the minus signs. Hmm. But that's 0 bar. Reason, what does bar mean? Bar means, just for reminder, this is x squared minus 2 plus, it's the definition of bar. It's the coset corresponding to this thing as its coset representative. And the question is, why is that equal to this? x squared minus 2. And the answer is, two cosets are the same precisely when you take their coset representatives and you subtract them. Take that minus that. Is it in the subgroup? Yeah, it's x squared minus 2. Minus 0, which is just x squared minus 2. So is that minus that inside here? Of course it is. So we plugged in alpha and we got 0. So, wow, we always get the same thing. Yeah, you always get the same thing because you preload the thing. To, to be exactly the, the, the form of expression that's going to give you a zero inside the factor ring. The intuition, folks, is that when you've built this factor ring, that anything that's a multiple of p of x is zero, at least in the factor. Because anything that's a multiple of p of x minus zero is going to be a multiple of p of x. So if you can build something that kicks out a multiple of p of x, you've, in effect, called that zero. All right, let's do another one. Example, example, let's try, yeah, this one. Um, here's a polynomial, f of x equal to x squared plus x plus 1 in z2x. Question, Lindsay, please. Let's see, the, the A meaning what? I don't keep at it. Oh, I see. I see. To, yeah, to, I, I didn't explicitly remind you that the things inside Q we're going to be identified with the things inside Q bar. So I could have done that as step three, view the rationals as living inside the factor ring by associating each one with a bar. So I sort of did that without explicitly telling you that I've done that. Let 2 be identified with 2 bar. And that was the only place I had to do it because the other coefficient didn't appear. Yeah. So yeah, technically I've done that here. And if you'd like to throw in a, another step, we're identifying all the elements of Q with elements in here in this factor ring inside E by associating with their bars. All right. Let's do this one. Let's see. The book, I think, actually gives you the details in this, but it'll be, I think, instructive to knock out some of the details. All right. So here's a polynomial. I'm viewing it as a polynomial in Z2x. So let's see. Oh, it's a polynomial in Z2x. It's a polynomial with degree less than or equal to 3. So I can check whether or not this polynomial is irreducible in Z2 it's simply by checking for zeros. If I plug in, well, there's only two things to check here. So it's nice working over finite fields because checking for zeros, you just do it by brute force. Just plug them in, see if you get any. If I plug zero in, one comes out. 
If I plug one in, I get one plus one plus one. One comes out. So in neither of the two possibilities do I get zero. So since the degree of f of x is less than or equal to three, and f has no zeros, no zeros in z2, just check it. In z2, f is irreducible in Z2X. Mm -hmm. Now, in these finite field examples, the question of when you form the corresponding field in which this polynomial has a zero, how many elements are in that field comes into play. And here's how you answer that question. So step two, we can form this thing. The field E equals Z2x coset x squared plus x plus 1. It's a field. It's a field. Let's see, it contains the original field. The original field here was Z2. How does it do that? I ask you to take any element inside Z2, we'll call it A, and associate it with its coset. In other words, with A plus x squared plus x plus 1. So that's where Z2 lives. Leave that. Take this thing out. All right, now what we're going to do is analyze this new field. So, what is E? How many elements in E? How big is that field? And the answer turns out to be this. It will always be, if the field that you start with, let's call it, if capital F is finite, and little f of x in capital F of x has degree n and let's say, oh then this field, the field assuming f of x is irreducible, f x mod ideal generated by little f has this many elements. Tell me how many elements were in the original field, f, and raise that to the nth power. So if you start with the polynomial of degree n, and it happens to be irreducible, then the statement is, well, this is a ring in general, and the ring will have this many elements, but if f of x happens to be irreducible, then this thing is actually field, it has this many elements. And you can systematically write them out. Here's how you do it. You list out all the elements of degree 0, in f bracket x. In other words, you list out all of the elements of the underlying field, corresponding coset. Then you list out all of the elements of degree 1 and their corresponding cosets. And then all the elements of degree 2 and their corresponding cosets, etc. All the way up to all of the elements of degree n minus 1 and their corresponding cosets. And once you get to here, you quit. So for this particular field, when we list things out, what we're going to do is list out the constant terms, then we're going to list out the linear terms the polynomials of degree 1, and then once we get to degree 2, it turns out because the coset is generated by polynomial of degree 2 that we will have wound up getting repeats at that point. So here, in this particular case, we have four elements. Because the number of elements in the underlying field is 2, number of elements in F is 2, and the original polynomial has degree 2. Original polynomial has degree 2, so that just happens to be coincidental that those two numbers are the same. We certainly could have a polynomial of degree 4 that's irreducible. We could have a polynomial of degree 4 where the underlying field has five elements, Z5, something like that. But in the end, there will always be this many elements. Okay, so let's list them out. We'll list them out systematically. The first things you list out are the zero degree polynomials and their cosets. So plus f of x. Then you list out, oh, I haven't done that yet. So there they are. There's the first two. 
Next two elements, you list out the degree one polynomials. Well, here is one, x, and then you list out the other degree one polynomial. There's not that many polynomials, folks, when the underlying field, when the coefficients are coming from a very small field, when you're asked to build polynomials of degree, let's say, one here, well, hey, the only coefficient, if it's going to be degree one, is one. If it was zero, then it wouldn't be a polynomial of degree one, it'd be a polynomial of a lower degree. So there's only one possibility for the coefficient on x here, and then you're either going to add it to, well, what constant term do you want to use? There's only two choices for the constant term, either zero or one. So here are the four elements of this field E. That will always be the case, regardless of what irreducible polynomial you look at, that one of the expressions that you write down is exactly the thing that we call alpha in the general proof or the general basic goal. It will look like this specific polynomial plus the ideal generated by f. And so when we ask you to crank out a table for this field, well, there will always be this particular element somewhere. Let's call this zero bar and one bar. So I've just listed those out, zero bar, one bar. You want to call this x bar? That's fine. But this is the name that we typically give it. We call it alpha. So alpha, and we can call this x plus one bar. Or if you want to call it, well, let's see, that's the same as what? That's the same as alpha plus one bar. And there are the four elements. Now. Presumably you have presumably you have both an addition and a multiplication table. The addition table I'm not really interested in. I mean it, it is some table, but that's the less compelling of the two. Because you've got a field here, what you know is, well of course there's going to be zeros everywhere here. If you multiply by zero, you get zero bar. But everything else that appears here, let's see what happens when you form a group, the non-zero I'm sorry, when you form a field, the non-zero elements form a group. So what happens here when I look at the non-zero elements is I should get the structure of some group under multiplication. Now let's see if we can do the multiplication. Well, a lot of the multiplication is going to be easy because a lot of it's just multiplying by one. So in fact, that's one bar, that's alpha. You want to call this x plus one bar? I guess so. I mean, we started doing that. But if in your homework you want to call this alpha plus one bar, that's fine. It's the same thing. That's what this is, this element. And let's see, I'm multiplying by one, multiplying by one. So most of this table is pretty easy. Now things get a little bit interesting. I have to multiply alpha times alpha. So that's alpha squared. Well, alpha times alpha is, okay, but the problem is I don't see alpha squared here. It's got to be somewhere. So the question is, as cosets, what is alpha times alpha? Well, wait a minute, alpha times alpha is x bar times x bar. In other words, it's x squared plus x squared plus x plus 1. Because that's what the corresponding polynomial is that we're using to factor out here. Hmm. So what we're interested in doing is taking this coset, which is alpha squared, and finding it somewhere on the list of elements. All right, so what I need to do is figure out what this thing is so that we get that's equal to this. In other words, I need to write down something here so that when I take x squared minus that thing, I get a multiple of that. And there's no real good way to do it in general, but when we've got elements from z2, I can rig things. This is x plus 1, and I'll tell you why. If I take x squared minus x plus 1, well, folks, when you're working in z2, minus is the same as plus. So minus x is the same as plus x. Minus 1 is the same as plus 1. If I do that minus that, I'm going to get x squared minus plus x minus plus 1, which is certainly in here. So the point is this thing is this. So when I do this product, I get the same as x plus 1 bar. How did I get this? Uh, just see to the pants. I mean, just look around. We know it has to be one of the cosets. In fact, if you want, you can maybe do it by, by process of elimination. But the point is you'll be able to rig some coset representative so that that minus that 
is inside here, and it happens in this case to be x plus 1 bar. Now, if you want, you can use structure of a field to complete the table without actually doing any additional products. Because if we have a field, we know the non-zero elements form a group. And we know in any group table, each row and column contains each element of the group exactly once. So I know that this has to be 1 bar. Why? Because the second row here has to contain each of the non-zero elements of the field, i.e. each of the elements of the group exactly once. And then I can sort of work you know, across this way and see what else do I need here in alpha here. If you want to check that your multiplication is on target, go ahead and actually knock out that times that. In fact, maybe that's instructive here. Look, if I do x plus 1 bar times x plus 1 bar, let's see what I get. Well, I get x squared plus, let's see, oh, what is this going to be? Oh, x squared plus, <laughs> hmm. But wait, I'm working in z2. So that's 0 in z2. That's nice. So let's see, x squared. Oh, but wait a minute. What did we just find out about x squared? x squared is, let's see, x squared is alpha, right? That turned out to be x plus 1. So I'll write it as x bar squared plus 1 bar. And I have to figure out what x bar squared is. That's what this is. I happen to be calling it alpha, and that's fine x bar squared turned out to be x plus 1. So this is x plus 2 bar. Huh? But 2 is 0 in z2, which is what we call out. OK, so now we have this way of somehow producing fields. That's really nice. Remark, we've just written down a ring that has four elements. This ring is manifestly not Z4. Why? Because Z4 is certainly not a field. It's got zero divisors in it. We've just written down a ring with four elements that's not a ring that you've seen before, but is an elegant way to build a field that has four elements. So look, with this in mind, that the number of elements inside a factoring of this form is, tell me how many elements were in the underlying field how many elements you're allowed to use as coefficients. Tell me what the degree of the polynomial is. If you form the corresponding coset ring, you get a ring that has this many elements in it, number of elements raised to a power. And so what that allows you to do is, as long as you're able to find irreducible polynomials having specified degrees, it allows you the opportunity to build many different fields having, in some sense, a prescribed number of elements in it. So for example, if I wanted you to build a field that had 125 elements, hmm. well, all I'd need to do then is find a field of this form where the number of elements in F in the coefficients is 5 and the degree of the polynomial that I'm using is 3, because then the corresponding field that I'd form would have 5 cubed elements. And I could presumably write it out. So here's a recipe, a recipe to form a field having, having p to the n elements where p is prime. Step one, start with the field f equals zp. Well, at least that's a field when p is prime. That's good. Step two, find some polynomial. Let's call it little f of x inside zpx. In other words, inside f bracket x, which has two properties, degree of f equals n, degree of f of x equals n. 
And secondly is irreducible in z bracket x, in z p x. Find a polynomial that does that. Then step three, simply form the field. Here's the field. Let's call it E. Form a field E. E is the field. Z plus the X mod this ideal generated by that polynomial. Let's see, that remark says that there will be number of elements in the field, that's P elements, raised to whatever the degree of the polynomial is, number of elements in it. So if I can do this, then I'll be able to build a field having a prescribed number of elements. You want a field with eight elements? Eight is two cubed. Two is prime, obviously. So all I need to do is find a polynomial with coefficients in z2x having degree three and being irreducible. And you've actually produced some of those. So if you want a field with eight elements, just play the game that way. You want a field with 16 elements? Find a polynomial with coefficients in Z2 having degree 4, that's irreducible. So here's the recipe. Of course, you might be thinking, well, how do I know there is one? For instance, if I challenge you to find a field that has 32 elements in it, you now sort of know where to look. 32 is 2 to the fifth, so I'd like to use coefficients from Z2. 2 is prime, that's good. And what I somehow need to do is find a polynomial of degree 5 that's irreducible in Z2x. If I can do that, then I'm home free. But there's no guarantees that there's one out there. If you list out all the possible degree 5 polynomials, some of them are not going to be irreducible. Like x to the fifth is not irreducible. It's x times x to the fourth. And x to the fifth plus 1 is not irreducible in Z2x. Because if you plug in 1, you get 1 to the fifth plus 1, which is 0. So that's not irreducible. You've got to keep trying. There's this really nice theorem out there. We might do it next semester that says, if you hand me any field that looks like ZP, and you hand me any integer n bigger than or equal to 2, that you can actually find an irreducible polynomial of degree n with coefficients are coming from ZPX. So it turns out, regardless of what degree you hand me, you're always guaranteed that there is at least one irreducible polynomial of that degree over ZPX. It's totally not clear, but it totally works. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, well, it totally works. I mean, it, it, it's, it's this really intricate constructive proof. I mean, it, it seems like a, a straightforward question, right? Here, given an arbitrary degree, can you find an irreducible polynomial of that degree over Z something? And the proof turns out to not be constructive, which is interesting. They don't give you a recipe for actually writing it down. It's, it's one of these existence proofs. There has to be one because proof by contradiction, if there were new, no irreducible polynomials of a certain degree, then something else would happen that can't happen. Uh, question, if I hand you a specified field, like let's say Z2, and I ask you to build a field of let's say eight elements, well, you have a pretty good recipe of how to do that. If only I could find an irreducible polynomial of degree 3 with coefficients in Z2, then I'd be able to play this game and I'd get a field with eight elements. Well, here's one way to do it. How am I doing? I got a couple of minutes here. Yeah. Here's an irreducible polynomial of degree 3 in Z2x. So this is irreducible in Z2x. You proved for homework, this is irreducible. So you want a field with eight elements? I'll tell you how to get one. Take Z2x mod the ideal generated by this particular polynomial, and you've got a field with eight elements. But here's another one. This is also irreducible in Z2x degree less than or equal to 3, and it's got no zeros in Z2. One doesn't work. So here's another way of forming a field having eight elements. You take Z2x mod the ideal generated by this irreducible polynomial. On the surface, they look different. The thing you're going to call alpha in here has the property that alpha q plus alpha plus 1 is 0. The thing you're going to call alpha in here has the property that alpha q plus alpha squared plus 1 is 0. So on the surface, they look different, but it turns out that the two corresponding fields will be isomorphic. 
So it turns out, even on the surf, even though on the surface they don't look the same, the corresponding factor fields fields are isomorphic. That one's also not clear, but it turns out to be true. In fact, oh yeah, this is good, and then I'll leave you with the following two really nice results, and this will hopefully whet your appetite for next semester. It turns out, folks, if you and your friend have both written down fields that have the same number of elements, then in fact you've written down fields that are isomorphic to each other. If you give me a field of having four elements and your friend writes down another field of four elements, the two fields, after possibly relabeling, will wind up actually being the same field. So even though you and your friend on the surface can get to this field of eight elements two different ways, it turns out you'll actually have arrived at the same place. That's first. Second, again, to whet your appetite here, it will turn out, got to be careful, yeah. It will turn out the following is true. We've just given you a recipe for building fields having a prescribed number of elements. If you hand me a prime number and you hand me some power of that prime number, here's the recipe for building a field having that many elements. The theorem is for any prime and for any integer, there is a field that has this many elements. In other words, for every prime, there is some irreducible polynomial of degree n having coefficients in zpx so that you can play this game and thereby give yourself a field having p to the n elements. And moreover, this is the only way to build fields having a finite number of elements. If you hand me a field, you say I'm thinking of a field, it's got finitely many elements, it turns out it has to have exactly this many elements for some prime and some exponent. And it turns out as soon as you tell me what the prime and the exponent is, you've told me what the field is because there's only one field that looks that way even though there might be many different ways of getting to it. So the theory of finite fields is really interesting. The theory of finite fields plays the central role in what's called the coding theory course, which will happen a year from this spring, and that I hope you'll all be around long enough to take. And with that, that's the end of the semester. So, um, yeah. So if you need some of the paperwork here that I handed out, Last Wednesday, please feel free to come up and get it. If you have the homework that's due Wednesday, if you have it tonight, you know, feel free to turn it in, and I'll try to kick it back as soon as possible. Uh, if I don't see you before then, folks, I will.